Hey, everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me, as always, are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob. It's me. Just drinking my tea. Who's me? Diana. And it's Jackie, and I'm also drinking tea. I'm drinking peppermint tea this evening. Oh, wow. Peppermint. I don't know what my tea is. I forgot. Honey, vanilla, chamomile. Ooh. Honey, vanilla, chamomile, you have a lot of as things I going say. On. Yes, it's very busy here in the ABA Inside Track podcast studio, in which we don't always talk about tea. We usually talk about behavior analytic research. And this week is no exception, as we are going to continue our conversation, sort of an extension of last la, our last full length episode topic on classroom management it made us think about one of our one of our favorite little classroom management systems the preschool life skills program so we decided why don't we talk about the preschool life skills program and some relevant extensions so with that in mind we're going to be talking about three articles related to classroom management systems at the preschool level why don't we just kind of get right into it cuz three articles that's a lot of articles Here's the question, though, Rob. Do preschoolers really need a management system? Uh, have you taught in a preschool? You do EI. I mean, you, you know how little kids cannot behave as, as well as we would like. This comes as a complete shock to me. I thought they were all little angels. They're adorable. It doesn't mean they're behaving the way they're supposed to. I have a fun anecdote of how... Anecdote? Is that how you say it? An I think you're combining anecdote and antidote. Oh yeah, I or an antic, an anecdote. So like it's a have crazy an anecdote story. If that serves as a cure for poison, then it would be an <laughs> anecdote. No, I don't. <laughs> um, but I'm doing. I'm currently doing research right now with some preschoolers, and how's it going? Well, it's been going pretty good most days, but then one day I realized the need for classroom management when we were doing some high intensity exercise. Basically, just they were supposed to follow my lead of like jumping up and down and circling and all mayhem broke loose and they were like trying to go up my shirt and we're like <laughs> holding on to my arms and the person that was recording because it's research yeah. right they're recording this session she was like whispering to me like what is happening <laughs> and literally we watched it we watched it back and oh yeah i needed some classroom management strategies yeah. really bad it's it is amazing when you see those types of things happen and you realize like how tenuous the hold was <laughs> yeah. on order in the classroom. Oh, it, it is amazing. You quickly become a Lord of the Flies situation there. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you made it out alive. Me too, actually. I was really tired mm. for the rest of that day. Yeah, I mean, It was only 10 minutes. Only 10 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> and like I lost them at like minute two and didn't, I never retrieved them again. We were like, guys, guys, I guys. think so. Like, guys, guys. everyone um, needs to s- settle down. Just No, I was like, just turn around, just turn around, just jump, just jump, just jump. And then there's just, like, kids, like, hanging off of me, like, crazily giggling and being like, ah! I was like, just keep jumping, let go. It was bad. Let go of my arm now. Yeah. Yeah. Don't go up my shirt. That's okay. Kids are difficult. They are. It's one of those things that's a little more adorable when they're little. However, that exact same behavior one year, two years, three years later is just horrible and no one can stand it. So it's important that we realize that these are problems at the preschool level. And that's really kind of the crux of all of the articles we'll be going over today. So in quick quick summary, and then we'll get into our, our first article, we will be reading Evaluation of a Class wide teaching program for developing preschool life skills by Hanley Heal, Tiger, and Invardson from the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 2007. Then we'll be reading two extensions and follow-up articles, Effects of Responding to a Name and Group Call on Preschoolers Compliance by Bulio, Hanley, and Robertson from Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 2012, and Prevention of Problem Behavior by Teaching Functional Communication and Self-Control Skills to Preschoolers by Lazinski and Hanley Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, 2013. So have either of you used preschool life skills, the program as outlined in the 2007 article? No. No, I haven't yet, but I want to really bad. All right, you PhD levels, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop some, some knowledge on Woo! you. I have I'm not, only, on not only read this article like eight times, I have actually implemented this program in a preschool classroom for children with dis- various disabilities, including autism, and then also as a, a tier two intervention social skill implementation. So I have actually run preschool life skills. I have I have lived to tell 
the preschool life skills tale. I can't wait to hear what you did. Oh, it was great. I'm going to tell all the names, all the people involved. No, I'm kidding. No, you're not. I will just generally speak about my experiences. But I think if you have not read the Preschool Life Skills program, I know some folks like to read the articles and then follow along for sort of our discussion. Some folks like to listen to our discussion and then maybe find the articles you know, later if it's a topic of, of interest. I recommend anyone who is going to be working on social skills, not just with preschoolers, read this article. Because honestly, after I read it, it was one of the first times I realized, wait a minute, you can teach social skills anytime you want to. It was the first article that got me kind of attuned, attuned to the idea of behavioral skills training. And it was the first article that made me realize, wait a minute, you can take data on social skills, not just by waiting around and telling some poor aide who's never been trained on the skill, you know, take data on listening all day long. And then they just write a bunch of pluses and minuses. You can say, no, I'm going to set up a moment in which they're nice. going to listen or not listen. Take data on that. Right. I like that. It's like if you're doing incidental teaching, you're like, and you say, I sure hope an incidental teaching opportunity happens at some point today. <laughs> I love that. No, you got to set those up. Yes. and You are in charge of your own destiny. It's very forgotten. And this is also an article where just, you know, I, I know we've read a number of articles by, by Greg Hanley. You both know Greg Hanley from, from, from PhD programs. But this was an article where I emailed him to ask him for some, for some clarification. And not only did he email me back. But um, he, he called me back and he left me a voice message, which I have saved on my phone. I think <laughs> that's adorable. That's cute. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I it hope somebody so nice. does that to me in real life someday. <laughs> it probably will not happen, but maybe. I have to be smarter. Like hashtag Professor Dreams right, right? there. I got to be smarter. Got to be smarter. When someone saved your voicemail, like, oh, my God, I got to call the Jack yeah. McDonald. Yeah. That's sweet, though, Rob. I know. I was. I don't. I don't meet as many. He's famous a good people. guy, and he. Yeah. You know, loves to see it. The, he was this type our, of work extended. He was on our Babbitt. Our Babbitt special. He. He was. He was willing to come on and chat about Babbitt back yeah. in the back in the fall, a million years ago. It seems. It does seem like a million years ago. So full disclosure. Full disclosure on this article. I got a voicemail from the author, <laughs> so I'm a little biased. Rob's a little biased. A little biased there. So why did they do the preschool life skills? Well, then this is a statistic that I. I always thought it went the other way around, but. The findings with non-parental care, so children who are in daycare programs, there is a higher rate of problem behavior over time. I think it was you know thirty percent higher. So so it wasn't great. Kids who kids who are in non-parental care, so they're in daycare pretty much, or they're in a preschool, have a much higher chance of engaging in problem behavior later on in life. Which you would again think, I guess that makes sense. And and the articles themselves sort of keep coming back to that idea. Of, well, maybe it's because they not only could learn poor behavior because you've got a Jackie situation where you have all these little kids and you got 10 minutes and you lose control of the kids and they're probably getting all sorts of reinforcement in the form of attention, maybe tangibles when they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. True. And then the kids who were behaving appropriately watch the kids who aren't behaving appropriately mm -hmm. get those reinforcements and say, what kind of a sucker am I oh. being? I better also climb up Jackie's shirt right. to get more attention. I never thought to do that. That's a great idea. Well, when I was home, I was so well behaved. Well, you think about it. I mean, at home, you're probably in no more than a one to three ratio mm -hmm. of children of parents that's not to all true okay well most of the <laughs> time at least one to three preschoolers oh yeah that's true you're right most of the time mm -hmm. and then at, when you go to school the ratio is going to be much higher you also have, probably have access to more reinforcement throughout the day because you're at home if you have a younger sibling and your parent has to give more care to say a baby you're just going to go play with your favorite toys it's not like at school where it's oh now i'm just stuck in this environment where i don't have as much attention as the other kids and I hate these items near me, or I'm not as reinforced by the other activities going on around me. Well, it's true that you probably are limited in what your other options are in the classroom. Yeah, mm. that's probably true. I mean, I think that plenty of attention maintained behavior can get shaped up at home, oh, particularly yes. when there are new siblings around. Definitely. So it's not that you send your grubby little ankle biter to daycare and then they come back a living terror mm. all the time, but... You can easily see how there are contingencies in place at a daycare situation that could produce those types of challenges. Yes. It makes me scared. No, nah, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. Thanks, Don't guys. Don't worry. It'll be fine. But it You've was, seen our children. That's true. But it is <laughs> funny. As I'm you know, reading the introduction of both Hanley's article and uh, Lazinski's article when they're like, with the majority of American children experiencing non-parental daycare... It can't all be care. Europe where we have whatever magical croissant system they have right? there. It's like, Take that, Europe. It's, just <laughs> it's highly correlated with teacher and parent reports of lower social competence, 
higher interpersonal conflict, and more problem behavior such as aggression and disobedience. So thank you, daycare system. I love that. You failed us. Why? And everyone's like, it's always great to send your kid to daycare. They'll learn so much from other kids. Bad things. Apparently. Yeah. So that's really where that's really where the preschool life skills sort of came out of. The idea that, well, we've got all these kids who are more and more going to a situation where they have worse and worse outcomes. And is there an easy way to put together a number of skills that could be taught to allow for functional communication, pretty much just functional communication training. It's just fancier functional communication training. Teach the kids to access the reinforcers they want in socially appropriate ways. And if we do that, do we see that over time the kids are engaging in less challenging behavior? So since we're really going to focus mostly on the extensions, we're sort of just going to give you the, the skeleton of the preschool life skills program and sort of what it, what it actually looks like. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of the detail around the reasoning why and all the parts of the experimental design. You're going to give us a cursory frosting of yes. the PLS cake. Be- there you go. That sounds that sounds yum, 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 yum. yummy yummy yummy. But basically if we can teach these skills, do we see that kids who receive training in these skills perform better than kids who are in a separate classroom or or actually some kids in the same classroom but who don't get that training, do they just engage in worse and worse and worse behavior over time? And spoiler alert, they they kind of do. So, the basics of what the preschool life skills are there are 13 skills, and they're sort of broken up into four different categories. There are a bunch of units. So there's instruction following. So the idea of if adult calls a child by their name, they would you know stop and they would look up. They would say stop. yes. Stop. Look, look up. Say listen. yes. They would also comply with simple one-step instructions. Comply with multi-step instructions. Then there's a second unit on just basic functional communication. Do they request assistance? So do they say help me, please. Can they request attention? Excuse me. Look at me. You know, there, there are different ways to do it, but it's pretty much excuse me. Look at me. <laughs> that one I Why love. won't you love me? Because <laughs> I can imagine just like a little kid just like screaming and being like, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the framed requesting. May I have or can I have? And uh, framed requesting to adults and peers also, which is a skill that we don't really practice. Mostly it's, the kid took my thing. Teacher, get my thing for me from the kid who took the thing. Why don't you go ask them? They won't give it to me. It's Yeah, there's, it never ends. If you have kids, you, you know what I'm talking about. Tolerance for delay. So tolerating delays imposed by adults. They say, okay, and they wait up to 30 seconds for the adult to do something. I love that one. And then delays imposed by peers. So same thing, but with peers. And then finally... The everyone's favorite friendship skills. I love them. Saying thank you when someone gives you something. Acknowledging or complimenting other people. Or when someone arrives saying hello or I like the, you know, whatever. But it's mostly just acknowledging that people exist other than you. And then offering or sharing. So if someone arrives, offering to play with them. And then finally comforting someone in distress. Are you okay? So 13 skills across these four different units. Those are great. Yeah. I have a funny tidbit about um, your child. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So when Diane and I were doing our PhD program, we would frequently have late nights where we would study, and her now oldest son would come and see us and give us, like, hugs, um, and we'd go to Starbucks, and he would get chocolate milk, and then Rob would come pick him up. Yep. And one time, our friend Berglund, hey, Berglund, I know you're hey, listening. Berglund. Um, I know you're listening. <laughs> I can see you listening. Berglund made this food that was like really healthy like broccoli and nothing else basically oh, yeah. and it may have had kale and yeah it. it was like really really healthy and 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 everyone's like can i try some and she's like sure here have some and he like puts it in his mouth and you could see like the look of disgust on his face and then he's like slowly chewing slowly chewing he's like mmm thank you <laughs> and it's it was good. yeah it was awesome because you could totally tell totally just wanted to puke it all up but he learned that nice friendship skill of saying he thank did. you he's probably four yeah he was yeah he was really young but it was hilarious yeah and i'm all when i always read this i think of owen at that one time because <laughs> most people would not have done that but he was just like slow chew slow chew like when is this gonna be done <laughs> it was awesome <laughs> not all of my children would have responded that way no 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 no. no. So the basic format of the preschool life skills in the in the initial article and in the initial research was in an actual preschool. 
So the teacher would do uh, sort of, uh, they'd model the skill to the students. They'd give them a chance to practice. And then they would just set up evocative situations throughout the day. I love that word, evocative. Oh, they're so evocative situations. What does that mean, Rob? It's not provocative. No, they're not. Pro- oh, yeah, I guess. I mean, they would set up situations in which there is motivation to engage in the response oh, or to not so engage in the smart. response. so smart. It's Who, true. Thank yeah. you. So, for example, if you just tell someone, tell your poor aide, okay, I need you to take data on how much this kid is requesting, that's kind of hard if all day long teachers are like, oh, you want this? Here. Oh, do you need this? Here. Take this. Take that. Because why would the kid ever talk? You know, I I don't ask for things if they're just handed to me. I just say thank you. Maybe I don't even say thank you. So you need to actually set up situations in which there's a reason for the child to engage in one of the preschool life skills. The thought is that they build on themselves. So you start with skill one and you go up to skill 13. So if you're starting with skill one, which is responding appropriately to name, you would show the child like, when I hear someone call my name, I stop what I'm doing, look up and say, yes, let's try it. And then they do it. And I wish I still had releases on all the students because I did have a year in which we actually filmed little lessons where I would model how to do the preschool life skills and we'd model the kids baseline so that we could watch it and we could train uh, aides in other classrooms how to implement so what is the evocative situation look like but i never got good enough releases <laughs> for those so i don't have those videos anymore unfortunately but in any case how did your aides do learning from the video we did a lot of practice as well i mean good. we didn't just do the video but that's not the videos easy were there to teach folks how to set up those evocative situations mm-hmm. but it, i mean it was helpful when you describe you need to set up a situation and when you describe it, people say that sounds hard. But when you watch it, it's like, oh, I just need to stand there and pretend I can't hear what the kid is saying until they say, excuse me. Oh, I can do that. Nice. Uh, it made much more sense to have that visual to go along with it. So you've got your evocative situation. And then after you've done the little training, that's it. So in this article, they set it up so that every child had to have two trials uh, or, or a minimum of two sort of like pre post test trials. They'd practice throughout the day. You know, when I ran this, I set up. Uh, I mandated you need to set up this many per day for for sort of the correct dosage of training. For all of the units or just one? For all of the units that we went through. And okay. we go through each unit to mastery and we sort okay. of do pre-post test. And you can read the article to sort of see how it's done. But, it, but in terms of how it works is you sort of go through, you teach everything, you do a post test of the 13 skills. Then you come back around and you practice the skills they didn't learn. So I've, I've read a number of the extensions, so I apologize if I'm, if I'm starting to sort of shove them all together. But you pretty much would have, you know, some of the kids, they'd get a certificate of the skills that they completed. You could put a chart up to show them what skills they'd mastered. But the goal is to go through them all some number of times and then sort of keep going back and, and post-testing them. They build on each other, so you should be able to complete skill one and two and three. And basically the training is this. I set up my evocative situation. So I say, Billy. Billy is either going to stop what he's doing, look up, say yes, in which case I say, great job, Billy. You listened so well. And he gets a little plus. He's not going to do that or he's going to only do some of it. So he'll go just look up and not say anything. Mm -hmm. In which case I will just... What do you want? Yeah, he might be something rude. Or he'll, you know, tantrum or refuse to do it or engage in challenging behavior. If it's anything other than great job, Billy, I will say, Billy, remember, when someone calls your name, you look up and say yes, and then you try it again, and you do it again and again and again until, as, as it's not a direct quote, they either respond appropriately or you are unable to continue. <laughs> That's awesome. You're too tired. <laughs> like, like CPR? <laughs> I, 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 I think more, to I have a classroom of 22 kids yeah. I cannot do this 50 times with Billy I can probably do it two more and then I got to move on so I like to think when I was reading that I like to think of it when you are in the drive through of that there's like a movie and I don't remember what movie it was and then they're like and then <laughs> and then and th- do you remember I, I'm no and then so if anyone knows what movie this is let us know on their Facebook page because I cannot remember, but I've been saying it over and over and over again all this week when I have been prepping for this that I cannot find it. But the person in like the drive through window, it's like maybe Harold and Kumar go to White Castle or something dumb like that. Oh, it's like a dumb movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the person on the other side is like, During and their then? order? Yeah. Oh. And then? And is it, then? Is it, dude, where's my car? It might be. <laughs> so I don't know what it is, but I think that if anyone knows what I'm talking about, please let us know on the Facebook page um, or email us. Drop at a- everything yeah. that you're doing and let us know immediately. <laughs> or abainsidetrack at gmail.com so that I can stop uh, obsessing. Okay. Over we, it. You want to close that chapter in your life? Thanks. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that's pretty much the preschool life skills. You go through all the skills. You make sure every child has enough time to practice. You do a sort of a post-test. And then you go back and you retrain the ones that the kids could not learn. And all the while, you're adding more skills. So once you get to skill 13, technically all of your staff and, and all of your students should be able to exhibit skills 1 to 13. If they don't, you give them the feedback and then move on from there. And that's it. And it was very successful. Um, I mean, certainly some kids had a harder time with some of the skills, but it was, for the most part, the students were able to learn the different skills. It was very easy to do. Uh, Social validity was good. Teachers all said, these are great skills. I like these. And and a lot of the skills came from, I believe it was a a survey of of kindergarten teachers. School readiness. Yeah. What what do you want preschoolers to come to kindergarten Mm -hmm. knowing? Yeah. And if you thought it was ABCs, you were wrong. It wasn't. It was look up and say yes. And it was ask appropriately and compliment other kids i would be really interested to see if there are cultural differences in baseline levels of these types of behaviors for preschoolers in terms of cultures that don't provide eye contact as much or complimenting how do you mean if there are cultures other than the united states that maybe do a better job of teaching these skills Mm -hmm. prior to age four Hmm. there might be i mean I i would think some cultures that do believe in structured schooling as early as possible might have implemented this whereas i think we see preschool and daycare sort of as a you learn some fun things and you're kind of playing but it's mostly so that your parents can go to work yeah i agree there unfortunately in most daycares i mean we we ran this because i was supervising classrooms for children either with autism or children who were in sub-separate classrooms so they had full day educational opportunities for the purposes of learning skills like i grew up in the south and if someone says your name, you you better look up and say, yes, ma'am, or yes, sir. Mm-hmm. And there's just that expected level of compliance to well, that that I don't know if it's, you know, I mean, th- that was also a long mm-hmm. time ago. So I don't know if it's changed generation, generation, gener- generationally, generationally or culturally. They don't go into it as much in this first article, but I know the Lazinski article does talk about preschool life skills as response as, as a type of response to intervention. So it is one of those skills that you're right. There might be a big cultural difference. However, if everyone learned that that's an appropriate expectation, some kids would have naturally learned it. Some wouldn't have. But if you teach it, then most of the kids should now learn that skill, regardless of their their background. Oh, sure. Yes. Anyone can learn it. So I, mean, I don't it, know. I'm just curious. Yeah, it could be. Now, I bet you guys think when I when I implemented this or when I started telling different preschool teachers about it, they were so sure that the kids in their classrooms, we'd have we did one sort of larger classroom of about about eight kids of varying disability types. Some no disability, just they just had been endorsed for having challenging behaviors that made it hard for them to learn in a group environment. And then we did it in a you know similar classroom, but the kids did all have diagnosis. Almost all of them, I think, were, were autism diagnoses. Everyone said they've been working on functional communication skills since they came to school. So they're going to baseline out of asking for help. The funniest baselines we ran were when we put things up on a high shelf and we told kids like, oh, let's play a game. Go get one of those games. How many kids do you think actually said, can you help me, please? None. None of them. They would say great things like, that's so high. Or like, how can I get that? No. <laughs> so they learned to label that they needed help, That's but not nice, to though. ask for help. They had a disguised man. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Which makes sense because, I mean, I think, unfortunately, a lot of times when we have kids who are diagnosed with autism or diagnosed with a communication delay, I think it is everyone, they take any language whatsoever as, oh, this is great. I'm going to respond. Which is good for a while, but at some point you get a little sloppy maybe. You forget that asking for help saying I need help is not the same as this is hard or where is that? Those are, those are sort of, you know, different, different formats. And they don't kind of do the right differential reinforcement. They just, any statement whatsoever, I'm immediately going to give you something. So it sort of was a indictment of, Ooh, we're giving these yeah. kids way too much help, way too fast. I think the component of seeking out someone's attention first before asking for help is also important mm-hmm. because, you know, often kids are, have their one-to-one right there with them and any type of, initiation on their part is reinforced like you're saying but in a big classroom you need to seek out the lead teacher in order to make sure that she she has her attention on you before you make that type of request so that is an important piece that is addressed in the pls Mm -hmm. too 
that's that's sort of the short the short version of the original PLS article, preschool life skills article. Um, I mean, certainly, I know I know from from personal experience. If you contact Greg Hanley, he will send you all his slides and materials. If anyone is interested in some of the kind of data sheets that I know I put together for my classroom, if you're interested in replicating this, or you're interested in getting some of the forms I put together, so that when I gave this to general ed teachers, which was sort of the next step, we never got to fully implement, but we did a little bit. The goal was to have something that was read this. It's on two sheets of paper, and you can run this that way. Um, that's why we did the video samples as well. But if anyone would like any of those big data sheets, please you can email us at abainsidetrack@gmail.com and be happy to share them. Or you could get them from Dr. Hanley himself, and that's probably more impressive. But you know, if you want materials, we we do have them. Cool. Thanks, Rob. And from that, we have two extensions. But before we get into those extensions, I want to make sure that anyone out there who's listening to ABA Inside Track as part of your continuing education process is able to get CE credits for listening to us. For we are, in fact, ACE certified here at the show. You will need to apply on the website or through the link on our podcast info link. And you'll need to have two secret code words, the first of which I will tell you right now. <gasps> and that first secret code word is... Spider, S P I D E R, like the man, or the arachnid spider. Interesting. Interesting. Don't look now, Rob. What? But there's one right behind you. No. Ah! It's wooden. Yeah, it's a. Toy. Do you remember that kids in the hall sketch where where there, someone writes it. He's like, oh, I finished my new horror book. And, and his wife opens the book and it just says, boo. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, I don't remember. But that's that's awesome. funny. <laughs> we get some, we get some laughs. We get some laughs here. But you know, what's not funny. Not replicating and extending your research. It's not funny. No. Luckily, preschool life skills has been extended and replicated. Hooray. Yay. So let's do this chronologically. So let's go into the first, well, pro- not the first extension. First one we're going to talk about. The first about. one we're going to talk about. <laughs> All right. I'm going to review Bowyer, Hanley, and I'm going to say Roberson, but it could be Roberson. 2012, Effects of Responding to a Name and Group Call on Preschoolers' Compliance. Skill skill one, pretty much. Writ large. Precisely. So the preschool life schools is super expansive. There are 13 different skills in there. This study focused in on one portion of that which is responding to your name which it turns out actually has a lot of components to it it does yeah i also like how they say it's a group call but they call it responding to a name rather than name calling because that's a different thing (laughs) that's funny i never thought about that (laughs) we practice name calling with the children they got really good at it so there are two studies in this paper but the first one is real quick and easy It was really just a descriptive assessment to determine if this particular skill responding to your name was a challenge for typically developing preschoolers. So they took 17 children who were all typically developing. They were, uh, they had two teachers. The children were aged four to five across several different days and accumulating a total of seven hours of footage. Wow. That's a lot of footage. Yeah. (laughs) Roll that beautiful bean footage. (laughs) (laughs) They filmed 10 minute segments of across varied activities and measured in 30 second increments how often the teacher called a child's name and then what happened after the teacher called the child's name did they provide an extra an instruction did they provide attention did they provide some type of tangible item or did they do nothing and then they measured the child's behavior after their name was called did they stop the activity they were doing did they look at the teacher did they say yes did they ignore the teacher and then also, did they comply or not comply with a, if there was an instruction given? When I read this part the, yeah. of the procedures, I realized very quickly that a lot of adults need these skills as well. It's true. Yeah. Well, especially husbands, am I right, ladies? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is awesome. That's not at all what I meant. Well, they, there's an interesting point in this article which is that they're measuring these two different things we're going to talk about this more they're measuring responding to your name by stopping what you're doing looking up and saying yes and then on the flip side they're also measuring compliance right does the compliance increase yeah following Mm -hmm. you responding to the name right and sometimes it does sometimes but sometimes it doesn't and i think that that brings up an interesting larger point because we also run into this problem sometimes we're working with populations with autism the question of do we need eye contact in order to get compliance to instruction following right 
And I think that that is a question that should be explored further. I agree. But not today. It could be, and it could be individual, certainly for students. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. one of those things of, well, if you're not sure, why don't you why don't you see? This is a, this gives us a little framework. You could give give instructions without eye contact and how well are they followed. And mm-hmm. if they're not followed very well, okay, I guess the answer is yes, you do need eye contact. Or, you know, even with, like, typically developing teenagers. They hear you. They're just do not they, doing though? it. Sometimes they may not, <laughs> right? Yeah. So you don't know if they hear you or not. So do you have to then implement this, like, respond to a name in order to, like, clean your room? Good luck with that. Just say clean your room, clean your room, clean your room, clean your room, clean your room. That's annoying. And I'm going to stop listening. But if I'm like, hey, Diana, and you're like, yes, Jackie? And I'm like, clean your room. At least I know you've heard me. Like, I heard you. But and I'm not going to do it. will not comply. Right. But at least I know I can, you know, rule out one extraneous variable. Yep. Right. True. So I just love, there's a, a lot of applicability to this research. Yeah. I think it's a really good question to, to ask is the, what is the correspondence between attending to your name and compliance? And do we need both? Or what's the ultimate end goal? But what they, so that was part of what they were trying to determine here. So they recorded seven hours of this footage. During the seven hours of footage, the children's names were called 298 times. So Mm. that was a lot of name calling. That's a lot of name calling. On the part (laughs) of the teachers. Calling of the name. And what they found is that on the part of the teachers, following the child's name being called, there was an instruction delivered about 70% of the time. And then the majority of the remaining percent of the time, nothing happened following the name. Makes sense. Right. Mm -hmm. So very often the name was a precursor to some type of demand. On the part of the child, the most common response for once their name was called is that the child stopped and looked. That was about 50% of the time. Sometimes, less often, the child ignored the name call entirely, which was about 20% of the time. And sometimes they only stopped, sometimes they only looked, and never, ever, ever did they stop, look, and say yes. Because these kids were not from the South, apparently. Right. Right. Yes, ma'am. They also measured percentage of compliance when an instruction was delivered. And they found that if the child stopped, looked, or stopped and looked, a compliance occurred about almost 80% of the time to that instruction. And if they it appeared to be ignoring the instruction by doing none of those things, compliance still occurred at about 60% of the time. So... Engaging in all of these, responding to name behaviors, was not completely correlative with whether the instruction was actually followed. So Hmm. that's what we learned from study number one. This is not a skill in its full form of stopping, looking, and saying yes. That was not intact across any preschool children. Pieces of it were there. Uh, Also, compliance was higher when those pieces were included. So they felt from there that it would make sense to carry on teaching some of the children to do this whole format of responding to the name in order to increase, hopefully, compliance. Yeah. So that moves us on to study two. I love journal articles with multiple studies. You do? Yeah. Oh, I, I do don't. Not. Oh, guys. Because I read them, I it's, like, it's like, I've like learned bonus. so much. Oh, there's another one. Oh. Bonus. I think it's like a bonus. You're like, bonus. It takes me I'm back like, to, to school, finished. though, when you're like, I got to get this done because I'm, I'm late for class. Like, oh, study, done. Study two. Oh, no. No, I love it. I think it's, it, I'm like, ooh, more gem. That just means that there's like more to do, more to see. And usually when I'm going to sit down and read my articles, I give myself plenty of time, Rob. <laughs> plenty of time. It's my joy at the end of the night. Yeah. Oh, I'd, yeah. I'd rather read five short articles than one article that's 50 pages with five studies built into it. No, not me. Mm. I'm like you, Rob. Yeah. Not me. I want to get a lot done. I think most of my students would ac- agree with you guys because I'm always like, and there were seven studies. And they're like, because <gasps> it's like you did more work, but you get the same amount of credit. No. Like I only it's read about, one paper. It's all about knowledge, yeah. guys. It's all about knowledge. But I want to read seven mm-hmm. studies. I want to okay. say I read seven studies last sure. night. Sure. Right. They were three pages each. <laughs> They were one page each. <laughs> All right. So I used to put a big check mark on the top. I was done. Mm-hmm. It's very satisfying. I would only get to do one check mark versus seven check marks. You could put it on top of each one. Mm, not the anyway, same. sorry. I digress. It's a game. All right. So then they moved on to study two. In this study, there were 
technically 12 typically developing children who participated. They were aged 3 to 5. However, it was both in within subjects and in between subjects design. So six of the participants served as controls. There were 12 participants, but six were sorted into each category. And they were sorted into category as matched pairs. So they asked the teachers in the classroom, please identify... We're the worst kids in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I need 12 names. Yeah, right? Who are your top <laughs> top students who are least likely to comply okay. with instruction? And they had them rank them. It was There were two classrooms, so six per classroom. So they had them rank them, rank ordered, one through six, and they took the top two, who were the very least likely to comply, and placed number one in one group and number two in the other group. And then so on for three, four, five, and six across both of the classrooms. Along the course of the study, three of the students who were in the control group left for reasons unrelated to the study. They made sure that we know it wasn't because they didn't get put into the experimental group. They then asked, when that happened, they surveyed the teachers and said, who else do you think <laughs> got to do a very other, good job Some other listening. duds in your classroom, teacher. Give me three uh, so more. So they just subbed those students in when That's that happened. That's nice. I know. The dependent variable that they were looking at here, they had several. All of those things that we just talked about as being called responding to name, they lumped together and called that precursor behavior. So that included stopping what you're doing, looking up at the teacher, and saying yes. So they wanted to see all those components together. So those were the precursors behaviors to presumably then listening and complying with an instruction. They also broke that down further, included stopping, which was no longer manipulating an activity within three seconds of your name being called. It's kind of hard to define something like stopping, so I thought they did mm -hmm. a good job there. Looking, which was making eye contact within three seconds of their name being called, saying, yes, yes, teacher, yes, ma'am. That one's self-explanatory. Waiting, which again is tricky to define, but it was stopping what they were doing and doing nothing further until the instruction was delivered. And then finally, they also measured compliance, which was completing an instruction within how many seconds would you guys say counts as compliance? If I don't know this? If you don't know. 10 seconds. Hmm. Yeah, I would say about 10 seconds. They only had six seconds. Oof. I know. Tight. It's not long. Yeah. So they were easy instructions was their justification for the six seconds. True. But it makes me think that at home, my repeated calling of name for like five minutes... Mm. maybe i should maybe tighten up that latency i there. agree you should i'm terrible there were in total by the time we were done with everything six different conditions but some of them are repeats so don't get too worried okay i was getting super worried i started sweating what? sweating in my forehead sessions were about 20 minutes they occurred across a variety of activities that they set up in the classroom that evocative just like yes just like regular classroom but had mm -hmm. Uh, evocative opportunities in there uh, they looked at individual and group name call and then they provided descriptive praise for compliance sounds good so baseline nothing special happened other than they had these opportunities arranged and they called students names when they called their name they provided a variety of instructions which fell into these categories of gross motor fine motor self-help concept formation and vocal response and included things like put the blank in the box, glue the blank, give me a blank, put a blank in my hand, and what color is the blank? Just to give you some ideas. So some of them were vocal, needed a vocal response, some of them needed a motor response. I like that. I like that you they varied, yeah. they varied them. Me too. And then uh, as the intervention, they introduced teaching of the precursors, and they called this part A. T the teaching package included instruction, modeling, role play, feedback, and intermittent rewards for compliance. But not tokens. Not tokens, just naturally occurring praise. Love that. Yeah, in the context of the preschool classroom. So much easier for parents and teachers. Yes. It's true, because then you don't have to worry about Anything. establishing them and then baiting them out. If, and carrying them around. If praise works, then yeah. just use praise. So they initially did that without instructional demands. Uh, they just taught students to 
engage in the precursor behavior, which was stopping, looking, and saying yes. They then moved on to adding in. They taught the precursors with the instructional demands. And they taught these by initially providing models of everything and then faded in, adding in the actual demands. After teaching, they went back to baseline. However, for some students, they saw performance to deteriorate. No! I know. So, because of that, they then re-implemented teaching precursor, but this time they called it B. <laughs> sure. Which involved reteaching after baseline, but fewer of the teaching components were present. And then, once the responding was reestablished in the B condition, they went back to baseline again to see how they did without the instruction happening during the, the sessions. Mm -hmm. If you take a look at the graph, they measured two things. Was the precursor, all, so all those combination of behaviors present. Sure. And what was the student's level of compliance as well. Love it. Yep. So we have individual data across all of these participants. What we see as a whole is that initial baseline responding was very low for precursors and moderate for compliance. Introducing the precursor teaching, we saw uh, precursor behavior increase rapidly for John, Earl, Lisa, and a little bit more slowly for Joe, Brad, and Ken. However, all of them reached appropriate levels relatively quickly. And their compliance jumped up and stayed pretty high once we had the precursor teaching in place. Lovely. We went back to baseline, and baseline uh, was variable for some participants. Earl, it looked great. Ken, it looked great. Uh, however, for John, Lisa, Joe... And Brad, we saw precursor behavior deteriorate pretty quickly when we returned to baseline. What is interesting to note, however, is that for John, Earl, and Brad, compliance remained high, even in their return to baseline condition. And then for the other three participants, compliance was more variable. I love that because then maybe just complying to a demand now became reinforcing in and of itself for yeah. some reason. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I feel like I'm that way. <laughs> Someone's like, do this. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I don't think I am. No, you're not. Children in one, one classroom did the teaching B phase. So that was John, Earl, and Lisa. They returned to the teaching Responding was recovered in those conditions, and then they did a return to baseline. And responding, so this is baseline three condition I talked about. Earl's responding remained high in that condition. However, John and Lisa, we saw a pretty quick deterioration of their precursor behavior. And for Lisa, we saw a deterioration in her compliance, not for John and Earl. Whew. Did you guys catch all that? Yep. Awesome. I have the graphs in front of me, so it's a little easier, too. Awesome, awesome, awesome. They're very busy. Very busy graphs. Yeah, they're kind of, there's a lot to look at in these graphs. You got your B, the A and the B. For the longest time, I was like, oh, they're in a new classroom? Oh, no, that's just the same thing again. Yeah. It's it was slightly different. Slightly which different. Which is why slightly they different. named it different, but was mostly the same. Very specific. And then, do you guys want to know what happened for the control group? Nothing. Nothing. <gasps> which is nice. That supports their hypothesis. Mm -hmm. I think that's true across the articles right? that... When kids receive no training whatsoever, they sort of just continue doing what they were doing, which is increasingly crummier behavior. Right. That's where you see the terrible you know what my mom said every mm. time my little brother did something? What? It's just a phase. Oh. You're wrong, Diana's mom. <laughs> my mother-in-law. Irene. Wrong. She wrote me such a nice <laughs> message today, too, for Father's Day. Yeah. No, here I am calling her out. In some ways, She's some right. ways she was right, mm. but it's not always a phase. Right. They right? can be they can be three nagers. This is like my favorite thing that people say now. Oh my gosh, she's such a three nager. I love that. That's they cute. don't they don't have to be three nagers. They don't. True. We can teach right? them. Right? You can teach this stuff. Life mm -hmm. skills. Yes. And reinforce saying thank you and complimenting and extinguish three nager behavior. I love it. <laughs> so yeah, that's what we saw for our, our control group Cole Gina. Pat, Bob, and Carl was 
nope. They didn't just grow out of it. It wasn't just a phase. They didn't learn these skills on their own. They, they didn't use up all their. Them. They used up all their non-compliance. They 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 gotta, gotta work gotta out, out all that non-compliance. <laughs> I love that. Nope. They didn't learn it just by being in preschool. Their precursor behavior was completely non-existent, and their compliance was pretty poor. Uh, even at the end of the study. So here is what we know. First of all, this is like their summary. They found that children were more likely to comply to an instruction if they initially responded to a name call. Makes sense. Here they did mm-hmm. say name call. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that was important to know. If we want to increase compliance, perhaps a good way to go about it is teaching response to name. In the second study, they found that teaching children to respond to their name improved overall compliance in individual and group instruction times. They found that they were able to teach these precursor behaviors using readily available classroom materials. And they taught that using a nice combination of modeling, role play, and feedback. Which is great to know that you don't need any additional systems in place. You can just do this fairly naturally as long as you're uh, cognizant of the situations that you're setting up and the feedback and praise that you're giving. Fourth, just like I just said, they found that that control group... Good thing they included it because now we know if you don't make the effort to teach these things, they don't occur on their own. Not for a little later. I mean, eventually they'll occur on their own, maybe. Right? Like Right. I mean, these are little guys. They were three to five. They weren't they weren't very old. Like seven to nine, maybe. But you'd start I mean, you'd think that perhaps the reason that the skills are learned is because the reinforcement changes. You know, when you start getting older kids, you might get a grade on your completion of tasks. Or the teachers become more aversive or there's enough structure in the classroom. So it's clearly signaled if you don't do this thing, there's a consequence you won't like. So you should just get it done quickly rather than take forever to engage. Whereas at preschool, those sorts of contingencies don't typically exist. If you don't get it done in time, the teacher usually just says, hey, could you do that again? Until they maybe do it for you or you just eventually do it. Or you don't do it at all. Right. You don't usually like fail your cut and paste worksheet. No. I mean, you might get referred for occupational therapy services if you really can't get that cut and paste down. But there are a lot of skills required for cut and paste. There is yeah. actually. Yeah. I couldn't cut for. And a color, long cut time. color and paste. Oh man. It like hits them all. Whew. It's a great activity. It's a lot. All right, and lastly, I didn't even touch on this for sake of time, but they also did a social validity assessment mm-hmm. of this aspect of the PLS, and they found that relevant stakeholders did mm. find this treatment to be valuable so they included that as a discussion point too great excellent yeah. well that's a lot of extension and replication but before we get into our last article of the night why don't we take a little break and we'll be right back Hey, ABA Inside Trackers. Are you interested in being a behavior analyst and you're not yet? If so, I really would recommend looking into the Regis College Master's in Science and Applied Behavior Analysis program. Our 2016 pass rates for first-time test takers of the BCBA exam was 90%. We think this is a true testament to our program. In addition, we're going to be starting an on-campus autism center in the summer of 2017. This is going to allow our graduate students on hands learning right at our college, and you will receive partial tuition remission if you work at the center, which is pretty amazing. We also offer paid clinical placements and graduate assistantships starting in our students' first year, where all of our grad students are working in the field either part-time or full-time. I find you that job. (laughs) That is part of my job. We also are approved by the BACB to provide intensive practicum, so students will complete 750 hours of an intensive practicum across their time at Regis. All of our faculty are PhD-level BCBAs with strong applied and research backgrounds in ABA, and all have published papers in respected peer-reviewed journals. We ensure small class sizes so that all students receive personalized attention from their professors and advisors are easily accessible to meet with students. Two more really great things that I want to highlight about the Regis program is that we host an invited lecture series at Regis each year, which involves inviting outside experts in ABA to speak on specialized topics relating to practicing ABA. 
Last summer, we completed an international service trip to Iceland. This trip enabled students to learn more about providing culturally competent care to diverse populations. Students and alums worked with children diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder and provided parent and teacher trainings for 11 days. This service trip occurs every other year, and the next trip will be in the summer of 2018. And finally, we have a great location. We're just 12 miles from the center of Boston. We currently have rolling admission. We're accepting students until we reach capacity for the fall of 2017. Please check us out at www.regiscollege.edu. Okay, and we are back to talk about our final preschool life skills replication. Jackie, why don't you get us started on that? Here I go. Go for it. Um, Here I go, get on my own. Someone's got to sing something each week, and there it was. We did it. Yes. Thanks. So we know that the preschool life skills, or the PLS, was effective in the Hanley and L 2007 article, but it wasn't completely effective, right? Not all of the kids learned all of the skills. No. Right? So that is why this study came about. So they're cool. refining the preschool life skills, um, and instead of doing a classroom-wide approach, they're going to be using a small group approach. Okay. So um, Rob, you referred to that before. Mm -hmm. So in public schools, and, and this is something if you're in special education, you may never actually hear because a lot of times when you're working in special education, you're already called in like, hi, here are the kids who are not able to learn in the classroom. They were not able to learn with some basic modifications. We need the heavy stuff. We need the, the best systems, the best modifications, accommodations, the best skills training you've got. But if you are either new to working in a public school system or you just never have gotten outside of the intensive special needs bubble, there is a system of instruction called Response to Intervention, or RTI. And that really refers to the idea that there are different tiers of instruction that can be given for students. So, for example, preschool life skills would be an example of a tier one intervention. When Hanley and all completed the preschool life skills the, was a tier one. Yes, the original, yeah. the original 2007 preschool life skills incarnation. Because you're talking about everyone can learn these skills. We know that some many of the kids who need to learn these skills, if we don't directly teach them, will maybe learn it themselves. But it probably won't lead to giant problems later down the road but for some of the kids it will so let's just teach everyone in the classroom the exact same thing and i bet that gives us a lot more appropriate behavior down the road it's the same for why we teach phonics instruction it's not because you have to learn reading by phonics some kids just learn to read spontaneously it's if we teach everybody phonics a huge percentage of children will learn rather than just doing whatever we feel like and then you get a bunch of kids who should have learned to read who now need to get specialized instruction they're missing instructional time it's a big mess you should not wait for spontaneous literacy. <laughs> yeah, you know, it happens. Many kids will just learn to read, no matter how bad a reading teacher you are. And this is the same reason that you'd have a tier two. So you would have, okay, well, not everybody learned with phonics. Not everybody learned with the preschool life skills. So let's do something in a small group environment. You're still using the basic principles that you had before in whatever your intervention is. You're just giving a higher dosage of it, and you're doing it in a much smaller group with more practice. And it's for kids that are higher risk mm -hmm. or that didn't learn in the classroom format, and it's taking learning opportunities with specific skills. So breaking down not just having a whole class but having mm -hmm. very specific skills with, within these small groups. And tier three is when you're just doing one-on-one -on -one with a kid. Yeah. Cool. Tier, tier three is usually, so for, for, for all of you who are working in special education right now, you're probably almost always tier three. Yeah, I had no idea about this. Probably Thanks, because Rob. you were always tier three. Yeah, Nobody right. bothered to tell you about all the <laughs> stuff that didn't work. They didn't go in a classroom and magically learn all of this. They've called you in because that all failed. Right. Yeah, so this, the Luzinski and all study that I'm going to talk about would be classified as a tier two. Still creating these learning opportunities, so setting up evocative situations for specific skills, but in a small group format instead of the large group format that Hanley and all used. Cool. Yeah, so that was one extension of the preschool life skills that this study um, demonstrated. Another was that they expanded on the social skills, and they not only taught precursor behaviors, just like Lauren's, 
Dr. Boyu, sorry. She's my friend. Hi, Lauren. <laughs> Just when they did stopping, looking, raising your hand. So they taught mm. those precursor behaviors. And they also taught several functionally equivalent local requests. So okay. they, they taught a lot. Yeah. And then they also did the delay and denial training. So they set it up very similarly, similarly to the study that you described, Diana, where they had 12 kids, six from two classrooms. One was an old classroom. One was a younger classroom. So they had different age groups to assess how this would work out with those different age groups. And they had they picked, like, the best kids and the worst kids in the classroom. And then they, you know, separated them out into a test group and a control group. So the test group experienced the preschool life skills program within these small group formats. The control group did not. So they just did their regular life. All right, yeah. During each session of the test group, they arranged evocative situations for the teacher attention, materials, assistance, delays, and denial. So they didn't do the entire preschool mm-hmm. life skills, the 13 skills. They only had three sets of skills. Okay. So the first set of skills was requesting attention, so stopping, looking, hand raise, vocal request, and then waiting for teacher attention. The second skill was the framed request, so those vocal frame requests like may I have, will you give me the, so that was skill two. And then skill three was delay and denial. So delay, saying okay, being okay with being okay, mm-hmm. not <laughs> engaging in problem behavior, and then waiting. So All good stuff. It's pretty good stuff, mm-hmm. yeah. So the procedure was very similar to the Hanley and Al 2000, 2007 study where they set up these evocative situations. They arranged each trial so that they could see all the students engaging in their responses, but then they used behavioral skills training to teach you these, each of these specific skills in the small group format. So each kid got to experience each of these skills within that small group format. Yeah, so it was awesome. less like during the, in the Hanley and all, and all 2007 study, they did it during circle time, mm-hmm. um, and everyone did it. Um, here, they, like, pulled them out in this small group, and they specifically mm-hmm. ran through behavioral skills training with each of the kids. Yeah, and similarly to the idea of the RTI, tiers of intervention, the dosage of preschool life skills practice that these kids received in the small group was much higher, because in the original article, everything was done sort of in a, in a, in a time basis so they had two days to teach each skill so you got to make sure you get your practice in if you don't teach a little Susie by the end of the second day just make sure you get her two practices in her, her, her number of practices right. in. whereas here it was very much around you need to practice to uh, 85%, 85% criterion. criterion yeah so every student had to get that 85% criterion in order to move to the next skill yes so they were really looking individually at each student so right. very much that idea of okay this is very intense this is much more intensive than it would be for the whole classroom yeah so that's basically what they did across each of those three skills they used a multiple probe design across skills to determine the effects of teaching on skill acquisition and to see if problem behavior decreased or not they also conducted the social validity assessment, which I think is important for all of these preschool life skills. So they looked at the relevant stakeholders and asked them if they thought this was an effective treatment and if they saw effects and thought it was beneficial for what they were doing. And the results They all said, no, I liked it when the preschoolers were bad. When they hit me, I liked <laughs> that. And so what's pretty amazing is that when you look across the trials in classroom A, which is the older classroom... They had three students there. They were 4.8 to 4.6, or 4.6 to 4.8, right? You go lowest to highest and not highest They're not old. Well, they're old for preschool. Okay. Right? (laughs) It's the older classroom because the the other classroom is young. that's fair. I I don't know why I was thinking that they were. The other one's three years old. Okay. Yeah. No, they're they're still young. (laughs) They're young old. They have their whole lives ahead of them. They're Benjamin buttoning. (laughs) But what you see is that during pre-teaching or that initial baseline, results for all skills was zero. Yikes. Zero for all three kids. Man. Isn't that amazing? The teachers were not lying when they rated them as the most in need of these services. Yeah. So no one requested attention, requested materials and assistance or tolerated delay and denial. So you just imagine that first art supply activity where they're (laughs) all grabbing at the same blue marker that went on on the center of the table and they're just like calling at the teacher like, I need that. Or actually not even saying that. I guess they're just grabbing it and screaming. I don't know. What would they do to not gain attention? Just just grab and not even look. Not not acknowledge. 
shove each other. Oof. Yeah. It's a tough lesson. Yeah. So then they started teaching skill one. And for each of the students, they acquired skill one within 20 to 30 sessions. That first skill um, was the, g- gaining attention appeared to be the by far hardest Absolutely. skill. It took forever. Forever. The other schools didn't take that long. But they did see during that skill one, like, whoo. And what I loved, actually, is once skill one was taught, they returned to baseline, and skill one was still high, mm. which I love. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't demonstrate functional control, like, right, when you take the treatment out, but you mm. don't want it to at this point. Well, they you, taught the skill. Right. Yeah. So that's great. That's not one that you would necessarily just magically lose when I mean, the conditions would have to not, completely right? change. Yeah. Yeah. Then they went moved on to skill two. Skill two was considerably less time (laughs) but all of the students acquired skill two quickly which was requesting materials skill two was request for materials and assistance okay a little bit easier Mm. the students maintained that skill for the most part during baseline and then they taught skill three which was delay and denial and this one again took a little bit more time but it was okay so they got it and then they did the final baseline phase which was maintenance and they saw that for most all of the skills they maintained, with the exception of delay and denial for Joy. She's seeing decreasing trend in her final maintenance session. Yeah, so it's that's, hard to wait. It is hard. It's, very, it's hard to say, okay. I know. When someone says, can I have a cookie? Wait for a minute. You're like, oh, no. Or can even I have like, the glitter? No. No. And you see similar results when you're looking at the, lo- the younger kids as well, so I'm not going to like... You know, beat a dead horse. I love mm-hmm. when people say that. I never understood until just recently. Like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I just didn't get it. And I was like, I don't know what this phrase means. I'm, like, bad with phrases. But now I understand Idioms. it. Yes. I'm really bad at those. Oh. I don't get them. Um, but now I understand it. And so I'm going to use it a lot. <laughs> but, yeah, results were replicated with this younger group, the 3.3 to 3.8. So pretty nice. Uh, one thing that they did talk about is that the kids in the control group did mm-hmm. not learn anything. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So just like the previous study, kids in the control group did not learn anything and still engaged in problem behavior, whereas the kids in the test group did not engage in problem behavior. Mm -hmm. So way to go, us. Okay. So I'm going to give you some take-homes. Sweet. Yeah. Take-homes for this article or should we pull into Oh, no. Take-homes for this article and then we'll we'll pull in. Is it wrapped up in like a little doggy bag? Yeah. With a little bow. Foil and a crane. picture of the dog. Oh, a foil crane. Wow, that's hard. <laughs> Don't that's microwave serious. that thing. <laughs> that's funny. I wouldn't know that either. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I, like, did not pass home ec or whatever you learned <laughs> that in life. But Basic microwave Because you were taking skills. shop. I was taking <laughs> shop. You're right. Yeah, so what they found is that five out of the six kids continued to exhibit all the skills. We did talk about that one who had a decreasing trend in the denial and delay uh, procedures, but really, they saw that the small group preschool life skills program was dependent on establishing those evocative situations, capitalizing on that situation, and using behavioral skills training to teach those skills. They took Hanley's recommendation of teaching several functionally equivalent responses per skill, so that's why they taught those precursor responses and three vocal requests to. Man for attention. Mm-hmm. So not just excuse. They used accuse me, hand raise, and can you help me, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. yeah. So that's... Varied, varied responses. Right. Which is important. Mm-hmm. Very varied. So very varied. Varied responses. <laughs> very, very, very. Very varied. They were so varied. And the control group was helpful, too. Just like in our previous study, the co- control group showed that it wasn't just the effects of over time. These kids would mm-hmm. have learned these skills in the preschool if they hadn't done the preschool life skills program because they didn't and problem behavior was still increasing. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we are running a little long because we had three articles Ooh, this week. Sorry, guys. So no, no, no. It's not anyone's fault. It's just we had three articles and it's a lot to go over. So let's pull into dissemination station for some final talk about preschool life skills and these extensions. <laughs> for some reason, I thought that was like the one that we've... Like a sound like effect that I already sound have. Sound effect, but no. And I was like, nope. oh, "Yeah, I'm the sound." <laughs> That's effect. live every time, man. <laughs> I'm the sound effect. If you can count on one thing for maybe inside track is that we do that train sound effect live train every sounds. time. <laughs> Five stars, train sound. That's why. That's why I love the show. I love trains. 
Is that a real show? Yes. I don't know if it's still on anymore, but it used to be on because when I used to watch Talk Soup, Joel McHale, yeah. uh, or him. The Soup, when it was newer, uh, would always highlight when that was on, and the guy would be like, and I love trains. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that it was a show. I don't know if it's still on, though. I'll look for it. Is it Model Trains? Yeah. Oh, good. Model Trains. I knew it. He loves trains. So, given that we have these three extensions, I think the biggest take-home point is the idea that you may not want to use the preschool life skills or any of these versions of the preschool life skills or extensions of preschool life skills. But if you don't and you work with young children, you are definitely running the risk that you are setting up these kids for learning inappropriate behaviors, learning the wrong precursors, I guess, or learning to respond to the wrong precursors and increasing the probability that they engage in challenging behavior. And sort of like when we did our episode on the good behavior game, why wouldn't you want to teach kids to do the right behavior as early as possible so that they have a longer, stronger history of engaging appropriately in a school setting? Right. There isn't a reason why, I don't think. I think it's just that people don't think about these types of things as behavior that needs to be taught or changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or that they're not already teaching this. Right. Mm, so true. they're they're not specifically teaching it, but indirectly through everything that they're doing in the classroom, these skills should be learned. Mm -hmm. I think right. that's it's what they're the type thinking. of thing where uh, teachers can very easily say, well, this is something that they ought to do. Mm -hmm. They ought to stop and listen to me and they ought to share with their friends mm -hmm. and they ought to be able to tolerate this delay. Mm -hmm. And either they're going to learn it just by being in this classroom or they're going to learn it by getting older and it'll come in time. But what this research has demonstrated is that that's not true uh, neither of those things are true and we can teach these skills pretty easily and pretty readily as long as we focus on them you know they they say that first grade is a new kindergarten right mm -hmm. really yeah so the types of things that you and i learned in first grade when we were kids is now being taught to kindergartners oh i get it i thought mm -hmm. it was i thought you had reversed them oh saying like now, no. first grade people were learning what they we learned in kindergarten, and I was like, what are they Wait, doing what? in kindergarten? Yeah. yeah, but okay, that makes sense. No, so there's very little unstructured time in kindergarten. There's generally little time to focus on play. Mm -hmm. It's mostly academic desk work time, even in kindergarten. So that just pushes back further. When are we going to teach kids the types of social skills and interaction that you do get through play? Right. If they are enrolled in preschool or in a daycare setting, they have the opportunity to be practicing with peers so i i don't i don't think that we should discount that going to preschool can be really beneficial for kids good mm -hmm. right because yeah. there's a lot of opportunities there to learn these types of social skills it's a matter of how is the class structured how is the teacher responding mm -hmm. to challenging behavior or how have they built in opportunities to teach these types of appropriate social skills and if they have then those kids are going to be you know far and away ahead of the pack when they go into kindergarten right but if they haven't then they could have more opportunity to learn aberrant behavior mm -hmm. so it's all about the setup mm -hmm. and when you go into the, a typical preschool i think you see a lot of intervention that is react is very reactive some of it might be just there are too many kids i right. didn't think about these skills ahead of time i know i want the kids to ask when they want to share but i haven't taught them that they should do that i just know that if i hear a kid come over and say miss you know, Mr. Perry, Billy stole my thing. You go over and you say, oh, you shouldn't steal. It's not nice. And then you take the item back from the kid and the kid comes up with some excuse as to why he took it or you won't share with me. And then you kind of are like, both of you are not being good friends. And then they probably end up getting whatever item it is they wanted. You know, they, they get a lot of attention for the wrong behavior. They also probably get access to items they wouldn't have otherwise had access to. Or if they'd asked, they could have gotten access to it. And you really didn't have a teaching opportunity so much as you sort of just reiterated, reiterated a rule that nobody was following in the first place and that doesn't deliver any amount of reinforcement. So right. it doesn't change any behavior. So reading these articles for me helped me shape how I'm going to be giving the preschool that I give. I give a preschool lecture every year mm -hmm. in August right before school starts to the teachers. And I always get to like pick my topic. And I think this has come at a perfect time for me because maybe I will give them a lecture on preschool life skills. And like, how Whoa, isn't that, wouldn't that yeah. be fun? And wouldn't yeah. that be a good extension? Then I could do a year long study of the kids, like all the kids in the daycare mm -hmm. and have the teachers 
be the experimenters mm-hmm. taking mm-hmm. data in the beginning, then taking monthly probe data. Like this could be like pretty fun. Mm-hmm. In terms of the implementation, you know, I implemented this with a number of different. I mean, the age groups are about about three to six. Right. Different disability categories. The skills that were the hardest were definitely the complimenting students when they entered or saying hello when they entered and sharing. Those were very hard. And anecdotally, it was they didn't realize anyone came to play with them. Right. <laughs> a lot of the kids, especially a lot of the kids with autism, they didn't. They were just playing. They sort of were oblivious it seemed like they were oblivious to the fact that someone else arrived that they should say hello so that was one that we were looking at the extension of well, what if we taught instead of the skill being when someone joins you say hello and offer to share what if we teach when you enter a group say hello and ask and then either ask or say hello and then at least there's like a simple cue of oh right. hello and then respond just like you would to the teacher respond to the student but we we, we didn't yeah. we weren't able to get to those but, before the kids all graduated teach kids to ask can I play with you? No. No, 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 no. Because no, no. every kid would say no. Yeah. Yeah. It's just you come you up and say, say hello. When are you playing? Or you teach let's the other play. kid to say, come play with me. Or you teach the other kid to say, here, take some of this toy I have. So sort of flipping that around. But all the kids graduated, so we were not we were not able to to actually practice that skill, unfortunately. Well, you let me know. I'm going to do this. This is I'm really excited about this, actually. I'm going to call the exciting. director tomorrow. It's good. It was fun. And then the way I know for some of the teachers, I had a moderate special needs teacher and a special and a severe special needs teacher. And for the moderate special needs teacher, she liked to set them up sort of like the tier two intervention. It was a social skill. So she had a couple kids and she'd set up these little lessons and they'd have a structured activity and they'd practice. And I think that was good for for certain groups if you just plan it to be yeah. kind of a tier two intervention because it allows you to change your dosage because right. again you're going to find kids that just they get asking for help they get the frame for responsing they get the delay they right. get asking for attention but you will have kids that just it seems like they are not getting it in the classroom and you may say well this doesn't work it may be a matter of they just need just like i mean none of the kids in these in these articles had disabilities nope and they still took 20 something what, 20 sessions, something right? sessions 30 sessions to learn stop what you're doing look up and say right. yes which sounds so easy that's hard man if you tell a kid to do it they'll do it right away yeah and you assume well they must know this skill well n- no they don't i would be interested to know if adding catchphrases music or characters to rules such as the ones presented here make them either more easily remembered by students or better followed as we learned about gun safety no no right (laughs) yes no they had songs they had the eagle and that crazy girl on the safe side program and none of those worked so diana but has anyone even even if you have nick vanslow doing your doing your videos nick vanslow did it as well he had that like fun safety guy in the that was part of his intervention though yeah, but it didn't. It wasn't. It wasn't effective. Effective until they did the actual right. in, in situ practice. <laughs> so indirectly, someone has studied it and it doesn't work. I don't know. I'm still interested. Okay, you do it. Go for it. And find out that it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I think kids remember stuff better. But remembering and implementing remember- is not the Why same. Why didn't say that would be true. the only piece of intervention? Verbal behavior is not beha- is not nonverbal behavior. But Rob and I are ganging up on you tonight. But if you I added it, Rob. Boom. <laughs> But if you added it to the intervention, but why would you need to? Because if, you just said it took twenty <laughs> sessions. To but if learn. there are, but, but yeah, but singing a song about it before you start your session doesn't mean it's, it's like a social go story, faster. Diana. Yeah, I don't know. They're not effective. I don't know. You yeah, give it a shot so. if you want. If you really want to, write a whole song about preschool life skills. You know, <laughs> preschool life skills. P L S. Hey, do you want something from me? Well, wait thirty seconds. <laughs> One, two, <laughs> three, four. Let's count to 30. <laughs> hey, I just entered your group and no one's talking to me. You should probably say hello. <laughs> Offer me toys. <laughs> so you'll help me. That's what I'm hearing you say. <laughs> that's copyright me, everybody. Copyright me. I wrote the album, oh, Preschool Let's Go. so good. <laughs> Offer me toys. <laughs> Anyway, I'll show you. I love. I like the the dena- the delay and denial. <laughs> <sighs> okay, almost there. Almost <laughs> thirty. <laughs> twenty eight, twenty nine. I don't know how to count to thirty yet, cause I'm only three. <laughs> anyway, oh, that okay. was fun. 
Any other disseminations? Oh. Nope. Um, yeah, I think we should end right there. Okay, but by the way, please do read the original. If you have not already, please do read the original Pichu Life Skills Plan. If you have never, if you've always wondered how the heck am I supposed to get data that is useful and accurate or valid on social skill intervention, this was the first article in which it sort of all just came together for me to say, wait a minute, you can just plan for it to happen. It's one of those simple ideas that nobody ever thinks of because right. they're like, oh, nobody ever shares with Billy, so we can't get data on how he responds to sharing. It's like, well, what if you... What if you made it so they had to share with Billy? Oh, magic. You'll get that data. And it doesn't, it's not all fakey. It's real, real sharing. I hate fakey. No, not fakey. No fake data. No fake data. All right, everybody. Before we go, I want to make sure that you have our last secret code word if you are applying for continuing education credits. And that is bunny, like bugs or Roger Rabbit. B U N N Y, bunny. And those are our secret code words. Thank you all so very much for listening to ABA Inside Track. We've certainly enjoyed having this chance to talk about the Preschool Life Skills Program with you. ABA Inside Track comes out every other week with a little fun preview episode in between where we give you a little taste of what's coming up on our new episodes. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter as ABA Inside Track. You can go find our website, abainsidetrack.com. And you can email us with corrections, thoughts, suggestions for topics at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. And if you're really, really nice to us, or you're really, really mean and it's interesting, we might read them on our preview episode and you'll be internet famous. Hooray! I think that's all the. Yeah. Did I get them all? Yep. Oh, you got it. I've gotten faster. It's only taken like taking like thirty something episodes for me to get that in under a minute. You're like beautiful. You're like the small print on all of those like lawyer. You're like the micro machines, man, Rob. Yeah, I'm micro machines. I don't know purpose necessary. Yeah, sure. Void were prohibited. That's it. That's micro machines. Yeah. You did it. All right. Bye now. Bye everyone. Well, everybody. Thanks so. Thanks so very much for listening to our show. We'll be back next week with our preview episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye. Bye. Bye.